So to start with, I'd like to say, introduce our first speaker today, Dame Professor um, Leslie Regan. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Leslie Regan, and uh, I've got the challenging task of being the Women's Health Ambassador for England. There's never been one before, and I started about 18 months ago. So I thought I would start by asking the question, why do we need a women's health strategy? So I just want to share with you how appallingly badly medicine has served women over the last three or four decades. Why do we need a women's health strategy? Well, we are 51% of the population. That is undeniable. 49% of the workforce is female, and we undertake more than two-thirds of all the unpaid caring roles in society. But women's health has not received the attention it deserves. There are enormous variations in access, and it's not recent, those variations. It's just because our current government has got this phrase called levelling up, which I'm never quite sure what it means. But uh, there are awful disparities. There really are. And we know that women he experience health inequalities and very poor outcomes that could be avoided. So we have to ask ourselves why this has happened. Now, this slide is slightly out of date now. It's about six months out of date, and we actually spend more money on disease intervention. But at this time, six months ago, 124 billion treating disease and only 12 billion uh, on prevention. And what I want to persuade you is that I need your help as tech giants to get this change, because we've got to go into the preventative agenda big time. So when myself and my current other speakers uh, trained, we were really trained uh, in this traditional viewpoint. It was a disease intervention service. And in terms of women's health, what we tended to do was divide women up and girls up into three groups, the adolescent, the women of reproductive age, and the women of post-reproductive age. And then basically, with a few exceptions, like occasional um, uh, contraception or planning for pregnancy, or which didn't happen in many places, we would wait for them to present with a problem. So it was a disease intervention service. And this is why I think we've got to this problem. Now, I know it's a rather busy slide, but don't worry, you don't have to worry the details because I'm going to talk to them. So we are one of the most obese nations in Europe. In fact, I think we are the most obese, but the DH doesn't like me to use that. Smoking claims 80,000 lives annually still, and yet young women in deprived areas, one in three or one in four of them are smoking, and we know that that has a massive impact, not just on their health, but on their baby's health. Alcohol-related deaths are rising, sharp increase in women binge drinkers. But the thing that you may not be aware of is that contraception, the single most cost-effective intervention in the whole of healthcare, has become really difficult to access. And we have to ask ourselves why, and it's to do with bureaucracy and fractured commissioning, and that's where I need your help to come up with some innovative ideas that are going to get past NHS Digital saying no can do, because we've actually got to start really thinking about this differently. So as a result of that, 45% of all the pregnancies in this country, that's 800,000 maternities a year, are unplanned. It means that the abortion rate is rising. It's never been so high. And whatever your personal views are about this, it's rising. And it's not rising in young women. It's rising in women between the ages of 35 and 50, usually have completed their families or have chosen not to have children, and they can't access long-acting reversible contraception. If I was a black pregnant woman in this country, I would be pretty angry because I, know, I would know that I'm four times more likely to die than a white woman and Asian women twice as likely. Suicide is now the leading cause of direct maternal death during pregnancy and the first postnatal year. One in five of our NHS workforce are menopausal women. It's only been in the last year or so that anyone's even been able to discuss that. And sadly, the only argument that really ever worked to get people to focus on how important it was to support women between the ages of 45 and 65 when they could be transitioning was the economic argument that although you can replace the 45-year-old who leaves with another body, you can't replace her skill, her experience, and her mentoring skills, and also with the fact that she's a role model for the much younger women. Now, even if you talk about periods and menopause in your house at dinner, I doubt whether the women in your home talk about having urinary incontinence, but one in three women over the age of 60 have got some degree of urinary incontinence, it's a taboo subject. 
And we know that in terms of cardiovascular disease, which is actually the, the disorder that's going to kill most of us in this room, not cancer, but cardiovascular disease, symptoms vary for women, and they receive their diagnosis much later. Uh, and surprise, surprise, because the drugs have all been trialed on men, they don't work so well. So they have poorer outcomes. And then when it comes to osteoporosis and frailty, which is another major, major killer, along with dementia, it's a major cause of morbidity and mortality, and we know that there are all sorts of preventative strategies for women which we've just ignored, and we wait until they develop the problems. So I think what we really need to think about is how you really do need a life course approach to women's health because we know that a woman's health in every decade of her life will then impact on the next decade. So um, I'm going to now suggest to you that since women's health care needs are entirely predictable, entirely predictable, that it's madness that we have p women who are not able to go to school or to work, for example, because of their menstrual period. So here are menstrual health here. It, the average age of menarche now is 10 in this country. So most of the women in this room will have had 12 periods a year for 40 years of their life. That's a lot of periods. And yet it's only very recently that anyone's ever talked about them. And we know that one in three girls don't go to school because of their painful, heavy periods. And we know that one in four gynecological outpatients are for women of reproductive age who are unable to uh, cope with their bleeding or their pain. Contraception, as I said, is really important because although most of the health service in terms of women's health is focused on pregnancy, I doubt whether there are many women in this room, or men for that matter, who've got female partners, who have been pregnant for more than two or three years of their lives. And yet we know that women are going to last, well, live much longer. My generation are probably going to live to 85. I have twin daughters who are 31 now. They, their life expectancy is 100 years. And so, we sp but we spend a disproportionately longer time in poor health at the end of our lives. You see that pregnancy is actually quite a small part of care. And then, Steve, you know, the thing that I used to work on, recurrent miscarriage, that's such a tiny, insignificant bit of women's health care. Yes, I'm sure the people I helped were grateful, but actually if I wanted to do something to really improve women's health, I should get the menstruation and the contraception completely sorted. And when I came out of medical school in 1980, women disappeared from view at 50 when they became menopausal because they were no longer reproductive and they disappeared, and then they would appear sometime later with a problem. So I think you'll agree with me that all of this is completely predictable. So why should the lady at the end of the road there in the teal dress, why should you come and see me in my special menstrual disorders clinic and need, say, a marina coil, which I can fit there and then, but if you ask me for contraception, I'd have to tell you, no, you can't have it. And whilst I've got all your kit off and the speculum in and you're feeling a bit uncomfortable, and a bit beleaguered, I can't do your smear because we don't have the contract for it. It's crazy. So that's what we need your help with. So the women's health strategy that was launched by the government uh, 18 months ago is not the first uh, influential women's health report. And the one on the left-hand side is the one that Sally Davis championed, our only ever female chief medical officer. Uh, she got an awful lot of flack for it because she called her... Um, annual report in 2014, the health of the 51% women. And instead of going through a sort of a textbook of all the causes, she just focused on the missed opportunities in the reproductive years and the post-reproductive years. And really, um, for the first time, raised the issue about obesity, which got her into a lot of trouble, um, ovarian cancer being poorly um, treated, and the menopause and pelvic floor uh, and urinary incontinence. And then when I was president at the RCOG, as I was leaving office in December 2019, we published this report called Better for Women, uh, which I would argue is the women's health strategy. Um, but the key recommendation was that we needed to have an NHS-led uh, women's health strategy. Um, because when we get it right for girls and women, I think everybody benefits. And that's been proven not just in, in, our, in our society, but in many others. I'm going to skip over that. So the Better for Women report was based on a life course approach, access to accurate education and information, absolutely key. We have to make women part of the solution, not do things to them. Prevention empowerment, and then it really focused a lot on the fragmentation and poor access to care that so many women find for their general maintenance health. 
So the importance, to, I think, to emphasize is that the vast majority of occasions when women go to seek um, healthcare professionals' advice, they're not sick. They're trying to do maintenance stuff. So to make it difficult for them to maintain themselves is a little bit like taking your car to the garage for its MOT and you go back at five o'clock and they say, well, we changed the front tires, but there was no back tires here. You have to go somewhere else. And you could go on and on with the windscreen wipers and the oil, da 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 So we had 23 practical proposals to improve women's health in the UK. And then COVID struck. And the whole of the world was paralyzed in March 2020 for about a year. And then in March 2021, on International Women's Day, a day that Steve Smith and I know well, because it happens to be our birthday, um, the call for evidence went out. And the promise was that the government would publish this call for evidence or the outcome of the public consultation by the summer. And it didn't come out, if you've kept track of all this, for another 15 months. And the reason was, well, the idea was to improve the way in which we listen to women, but they didn't realize that they were going to get 100,000 responses. I don't think there's any government department that has ever had 100,000 responses to a public consultation. So they opened the survey, and 97,000, as you can see, 307 were females, and the others were very cross men, saying how awful it was that the women in their lives were, were suffering unnecessarily. And they weren't short submissions either. They were very lengthy. And then there were 437 written replies from organizations with expertise in women's health care, and they were PhDs. I mean, the, you know, reams and reams and reams and reams of information about what's wrong. And then some really important work went on with some focus groups with some very disadvantaged women. And it was published in the summer of 2022. So I was appointed. I'm not going to go into the hoo-ha of being interviewed by Boris Johnson on April the 1st um, for this role. But I started at the end of June. And this was published um, in August 2022. And the proposal was we would have to boost the health outcomes for w women and girls because women are living much longer than men, but in very much poorer health and using a lot more health resources. And also, it wanted to focus on the fact that 84% of those 100,000 people had said that they didn't feel listened to. So that was a bit upsetting for the Department of Health and Social Care and the Cabinet Office. But these were the snapshot of some of the results from that survey or from that public consultation. And the thing that women wanted to know more about were gynecological problems, not pregnancies. Um, I don't know why fertility is in a great big bowl, but it's not meant to be. Uh, they were upset that fertility is usually a postcode lottery. They were very upset about the menopause not being catered for, menstrual health, and menstrual health, of course, comes into that, and the gynecological conditions, and mental health problems. One in five of them said they felt supported by the services available. That means that four out of five of them didn't. Less than 10% said they had access to good information, and most of them said that they were actually getting their information not from the NHS website, but from Dr. Google or their friends or TikTok. And 84% said that they had not been listened to and they felt ignored and dismissed when they went um, with problems. And many of them added to that, not only was that, but we said, and about this, that, oh no, you've only got one thing that you can bring to the doctor today. So the chapters in the strategy are based on these eight cross-cutting themes, which you can read as well as I can. But I think the access to services and the disparities in health outcomes and health in the workplace were the ones that I thought were the possibly the easiest wins at the beginning in which we focused on so far. I'll give you a little um, snapshot of those. And then the seven priority areas were based on what came up most frequently from those 100,000 responses to the public consultation. And it was menstrual health and gynecological conditions, which supports my view earlier about women have 12 periods a year for 40 years of their lives. So if they're disabled by them, we really are missing a trick. The two that bother me most are these ones, the health impacts of violence against women and girls. I don't think any of us fully understand the societal expense of violence against women and girls. And it's one of those things that everyone's nodding at me at the moment. But when I ask you, what are you going to do? Everybody feels, oh, paralyzed by the enormity of the problem. So I think that's something we've got to do. And the healthy aging and long-term conditions are also going to be challenging as well because of the fractured commissioning. So these were the year one implementation priorities. 
And the one that I really wanted to push and push and push for was encouraging expansion of the women's health hubs. So these are designed, I've talked about them in a moment, they, they, they are not one size fits all. They will depend on where you are geographically and the demographics of the population being looked after. But basically, we're trying to develop one-stop shops, or even if it's not a one-stop, then at least you are signposted to where you need to go for what you need, rather than go to three or four different appointments. Improving information provision on women's health. The website has got a lot better, but the NHS website is still very clunky. Supporting women's health in the workplace, um, care following pregnancy loss, access to fertility treatment. It's met a bit of a, a financial block there. The one thing that has done well for all of us who are menopausal is improving access to hormone replacement. So again, on April the 1st, the website went live and all women in this country uh, now can access a prepaid certificate so that they can obtain one year of HRT for the price of a single prescription, which for a lot of women is actually means the difference between being able to afford it and not afford it. So health hubs, so the aim is to act, improve access to care, improve women's experience of care. Most women in this room would like to go to one place to get sorted out. I don't think you'd mind traveling to that place as long as you knew that when you got there, all those things that I was saying to that lady, she'd have to come back for four different appointments would be sorted out. It'll only take about half an hour. Improve um, health outcomes for women and to also reduce inequalities. It was helped, of course, when we managed to get 25 million, a drop in the ocean compared to what I was showing you earlier. But at least we were able then to say to the 42 integrated care boards of England, OK, we're going to divide this money up. This is not per head of population that you serve. This is just so you can get a concept, a proof of concept, and get a health hub. And they don't have to be places. I think some of the most successful are going to prove to be virtual health hubs. So you come and talk to me. I'm looking at the lady in the red and the grey now. You come and talk to me on a platform with a video or a phone, whichever suits you, and we decide whether you need a prescription, in which case I email your pharmacy, or if you need to have some blood tests and some imaging, you would need to go to place A, if you actually needed, so say I presented saying I've got postmenopausal bleeding, there's no point sending me off for blood tests and scans because we know that we've got to sample the wound lining. So let's send you to a place that can do the procedure, et cetera, et cetera. So one-stop shops or hub and spoke models. And as I say, many of the hubs that have already started in those 42 integrated care systems are virtual and are proving to be extremely effective. So what's happened? Well, we've got the 25 million for them. Um, we've established a network of women's health champions. That's a story for coffee because that was incredibly difficult to do. Although when it's all started, um, all started up, they were so enthusiastic. There are lots of resources on the website now to support implementation. And there's a whole load of filmed webinars about individual hubs that have done used different models, giving you tips about what you can do. So I think that they really will improve access, reduce inequalities, um, make the health system more efficient. And there's also going to be great improvement in the NHS workforce as a result of it. We can't really afford, you know, the NHS is the largest employer of people in Europe and 80% of the workforce are women. So it's madness that we don't look after them properly. So I'm going to skip over these because I've gone, these are the potential new priorities for year two, but because we've had yet another health minister or secretary of state, no one's made come to any decision about those. But I think we will ma make sure that the hubs um, manage to cope with many of those things too. I think the other thing that really is important is that we all talk about equality and it's not what we want. We actually want equity and there's going to be many, many women who have been just too easy to ignore for too long. We've banned the word too difficult to reach. And we need to really give them um, a leg up to be able to reach their best health. Many styles of these various different people, and it is quite challenging working with quite so many different individuals. Um, but we have a new, new woman, um, Victoria Atkins, who seems to be very enthused by women's health, which is a very welcome change. Uh, I think I'll move over that. So I think what I'm hoping that you, I've impressed on you is that we need a women's health strategy because when we get it better for women, we get it better for everybody in society um, and we get it much better for less money. So I will just leave you that better is possible, but it takes actually um, a willingness to try doing it differently. And that's what I hope that we've turned the corner on. 
And this was given to me my, by my daughters, which I think is a really delightful cartoon. She's saying, I'm not bossy, I have skills, leadership skills. Do you understand? But my point to you is everyone here can advocate for change. And advocacy is all about persuading people to think and act differently. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to introduce the rest of the panel. Um, would you like to come up and join me?